<coughs> Excuse me again. Let me clear my throat. <laughs> Let me clear Let my throat. Let me clear throat. my throat. <laughs> so, um, we're still waiting on the parliamentarian. No news, they say, is good news, I guess, or not necessarily. We don't know yet. We are waiting on her ruling on Plan B. Plan B is to change the registry date, to update the date for 245I adjustment that allows you to pay the penalty fee. If the parliamentarian rules yes, those two rules and possibly more that we don't know about will be put into the budget reconciliation deal that looks like it is coming together this afternoon. The Democrats, both on the progressive side and on the moderate side, they have been saying very positive things. They feel that they are getting closer to getting a deal. Again, on my birthday, Monday, September 27th, they want to vote on this. We are still waiting on the parliamentarian to see if the immigration will get into the vote on Monday, September 27th, maybe Tuesday, September 28th. They will have a vote shortly, probably early next week. What's interesting, which we didn't mention over the last few days about the parliamentarian, hmm. Elizabeth McDonough, do you know what she did? What, what did, what she did do? Elizabeth McDonough do before she was the parliamentarian in the Senate? Very interesting and ironic at the same time. It's ironic then she must have been an immigration lawyer. She was an immigration <laughs> lawyer. Ex-immigration <laughs> lawyer, please, plays wow. key role in immigration reform. So Very you, ironic, isn't it? So you would think that she would be super down. Not for... necessarily because you could be an immigration lawyer for the immigrants or against the immigrants. And oh. in this particular case, she was a trial attorney for the U.S. Justice Department handling immigration cases. The trial attorney is the district attorney. They're the prosecutors. Uh. Oh, so in, she was a prosecutor, she was a prosecutor oh, in immigration Lord. court, <laughs> and she was basically a law enforcement mm -hmm. immigration oh, attorney. Okay. She also clerked for a Reagan judge, a Ronald Reagan appointed judge by the name of Royce Lambert. Now, as the parliamentarian to the Senate, she ruled against the inclusion of a minimum wage increase in Biden's COVID-19 legislation in February. A decision also that was a huge disappointment for the White House. She advised against incorporating amnesty just last week for almost 8 million undocumented people and essential workers in the budget reconciliation. As we said, her ruling was because the amnesty that they were including in the budget reconciliation was mm -hmm. brand new laws. New laws. And she said, you are not changing an existing law to increase budget revenue. What you are doing is you are adding new laws. And by the way, yes, it may raise income for the budget, but that's ancillary to you making a new law. That's why the Democrats went back with plan B. They're amending existing laws. They're amending the registry date, which is an old form of amnesty. That registry date is right now, January 1st, 1972. They want to bring it into the 21st century. We don't know the exact date. As we said yesterday, it could be January 1st, 2010, January 1st, 2015, January 1st, 2020, or some date in March of 2021, when we all went under quarantine for the pandemic. It could be any of those dates. And if you were undocumented, never obtained a green card before, and you were physically present on that date and remained in the U.S. through the time you file an application for adjustment of status, because that's as easy as it is. You file adjustment, prove you've been in the United States for that period of time, you get a green card. Easy peasy. There you go. Much easier than essential worker amnesty. I like right. it. Yes. Okay, as long as they pick a good date. Right. And then for those people who may not be eligible for the amnesty, they are also amending the 245I, which allows people to get sponsored in jobs, people to get sponsored by their family members, even if they overstayed on their visa, even if they entered without inspection, pay a penalty fee and adjust their status here as well. So that can cover a lot of people as well. We are all waiting here on bated breath. Yes. This parliamentarian, she knows immigration. She knows it. She knows it. Meanwhile, we showed video and pictures yesterday 
of Department of Homeland Security personnel, DHS and ICE officers on horseback using reins as whips against Haitians, trying to keep them back from crossing over the border. They are on the Mexican side of the Del Rio Bridge, Texas border. They are in encampments, but it's not really encampments. They are living in squalor, literally in squalor without food, sanitation, medicine, without any sort of plumbing to even use a bathroom, a toilet, a sink. They're just there on top of garbage. It's one of the worst conditions I've ever seen at the border today after those videos came out of ICE officers using reins almost as whips. It almost looked like it was plantation time. Literally the only thing they're missing are cotton fields. Yeah. Especially. The Department of Homeland Security has said that they will now cease the use of horse patrol in the Del Rio River area. We are going to prioritize other methods temporarily. They may bring back horses at some point. We'll prioritize other methods for identifying individuals who might be in medical distress. Those were not <laughs> medical distress. That was crowd control using horses with whips. Absolutely. That had nothing to do with medical distress. Now, the department has been closely following the movement of migrants through the hemisphere and working with law enforcement partners in transit countries. Biden is flying many of them back to Haiti. He is not allowing many to enter the United States and the few that are would have to pass a credible fear interview and apply for asylum. Daniel Foote, the U.S. Special Envoy for Haiti, he has resigned because of what is going on wow. at the border within the Del Rio River, Texas border in Mexico because he says he will not be associated, I'm quoting him, he will not be associated with the United States' inhumane, counterproductive decision to deport thousands of Haitian refugees from the U.S.-Mexico border. They are taking Haitians who are escaping dreadful conditions and returning them to dreadful conditions. Yeah. Okay? So all you are doing is now adding additional stress to Haiti between COVID, the almost overthrow of the prime minister, armed gangs. The State Department spokesperson, Ned Price said Wednesday that Daniel Foote has both resigned and mischaracterized the circumstances of his resignation. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said today that Daniel Foote never once raised concerns about the migration. 12 repatriation flights have left the United States. 1,401 Haitians have been returned to Haiti, and there are now less than 5,000 near the border. That's a lot. That is a lot. By the way, we didn't even talk about the earthquakes in Haiti. Right. You know, it just goes on and on and on. I don't know what the solution to Haiti is, but I know the solution is not return people to dreadful- To where they're trying to run away to from. To dreadful right. situations. You've been following Vanessa Gabby Petito. It's almost impossible not to fo follow what's going on. Young, young couple went on a cross country with Brian Laundry. The boyfriend went on a cross country mm -hmm. trip. They were, they were on social media regularly, mm -hmm. uh, documenting their trip. Real and then, sketch. And then all of a sudden, Brian Laundry drives home from a uh, Wyoming Teton National Forest with no Gabby, no girlfriend, and shows up at his home in Florida as if nothing happened. That's so weird. It's though. what ha yeah. So uh, then Gabby Petito was pronounced missing. The news took hold of this. You know, they said young white woman missing, um, blonde hair, blue eyes, the new, it was all over the news, and uh, Brian Laundrie was the initial suspect. They eventually found Gabby uh, yesterday, and they did an autopsy. Sunday, excuse me, they I did an was, autopsy, yeah. and uh, and it was determined that she was 
murdered. It's Brian Laundry, uh, who was in his home in Florida, the FBI has him as the number one suspect. Bizarre that nobody in the FBI or the police is watching this home. He leaves the home. Nobody sees him leave the home, drives away, and is now missing. They are searching for him all over. They say that he is capable of living in the woods, in the forest, and being able to survive on his own. There has been a history of Gabby and Brian fighting, mm -hmm. screaming, yelling. They Even the police were called once uh, on this trip. And, uh, and uh, the, anecdotally, um, uh, people, neighbors, friends have said that Brian was a more of a loner and uh, had a extraordinarily bad temper. Uh, Gabby always uh, tried to protect him from, you know, being around other people uh, because of, I guess, his idiosyncrasies or anger or temper or whatever it was that he had. Uh, but now that he has been, uh, now that Gabby has been pronounced murdered, it's a homicide investigation. The FBI and the police have let Brian Laundrie disappear. Nobody knows where he is. There's a manhunt for him and there is a warrant out for his arrest. Now, after Petito's family had reported her missing, authorities said Laundry and his family declined to discuss the case. And then on Friday, family members said Laundry had gone hiking three days earlier and just never returned. And nobody's watching this guy. That's where, that's where we're at. Now, dozens of law enforcement officers have been searching nearby reserves. Former America's Most Wanted host John Walsh is questioning whether Brian Laundry was really hiding out in his family home, suggesting it was a ruse to help him get far away. So this guy says he never left. Maybe he's in the basement for all they know. But I assume the FBI now has a warrant and has gone I'm into the sure. home and has searched the home and I assume he's not there. There was a lot of news reports that the Laundry family were not cooperating with the police that they were told by their attorney not to talk, not to say anything. And uh, it was extraordinarily hurtful to the Petito family because Brian and Gabby were in a relationship for a very long time. And the families Engaged. did. They, yeah. And they knew each other, the families. They have socialized together, these families. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the Laundry family was... Uh, uh, I guess for the, in terms of the Petito family, following the advice of their lawyer is not to talk, which by the way, I mean, is the proper, kind of protocol, that's, right? that's the proper advice, right? because um, there's nothing you're going to say that's going to exculpate you. Unless of course you have a rock solid alibi. Mm -hmm. You know, I was not in the Grand Teton, Wyoming forest with Gabby. Mm -hmm. I was in, Disneyland at the time, you know, but and they can't say that they because. can't say that because he was on Instagram and everything with her. Everything is documented, right? It was on stories. There's probably yeah. reels. There's a post. Exactly. Yeah. And the crazy, the crazy thing is, like, a lot of their followers now um, are. I think she even hit a. She might have even hit a million followers now on Instagram, yeah. and a lot of the followers are looking back at uh, timing. So like they're looking at the around the it's time, a lot of they, you know, because they literally documented everything so they're saying the day or the timing where she probably was murdered they're noticing that pictures on his page are Different. more so like propped up the phone is propped up so they're looking like it's it's from the bottom up uh -huh. so like you have the followers now that are trying they're, to they're starting to you know, sleuth a little yeah. bit starting to sleuth a so little this bit this is huge it is it is, is it is it is huge it's it's been all over the news um and you know it, 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 listen we don't know who did it. We don't. But I will tell you this. Right. If Brian Laundrie didn't do it, who the hell did? Right. There's only one. Why is he running? You, you know, I, I can't imagine that there's another suspect right now. You know, if, if you know, he had, he had, they were fighting. He was with her. 
Uh, all, of, he, all of this is all, documented. All of this is documented. <laughs> she was well, crying when the police was there. Who, like, who, if he didn't kill her, who did? Right. Vanessa, who killed it? Gabby Petito if Brian Laundry didn't do it? I've watched a lot of cold case files. I've watched <laughs> a lot of Law and Order. <laughs> yeah. I think this all leads in one direction. Yeah, that's right. It's unfortunate. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. Meanwhile, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention define intimate partner violence as abuse or aggression that occurs in a romantic relationship. Intimate partner refers to both current and former spouses. IVP can include any of the following types of behavior, physical violence, sexual violence, stalking, psychological aggression. Uh, IPV affects millions of people in the United States each year. About one in four women, nearly one in 10 men have experienced contact, sexual violence, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner during their lifetime. Over 43 million women, 38 million men have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner, which is uh, you know, why you see so many VAWA cases yeah. these days, unfortunately. Now, if you or someone you love is in an intimate part party violence situation, we urge you to call the domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. But, you know, there's another interesting angle, you know, about all of this. And it's not just, you know, we're, we're all very sad about Gabby and, and the family, you know, needs answers, obviously. You know, and it's absolutely tragic. But on Monday night, MSNBC host Joy Reid invited Lynette Gray Bull and Dorica Wilson on her show. It's called, uh, the show's called The Readout on MSNBC. And the guests are advocates for missing indigenous black women and children. And they argued that the media's attention of Petito's disappearance was, was sorely lacking when it came to the hundreds of disappearances that don't involve white women. Yeah. Now, Reed pointed out that the PBS anchor Gwen Eiffel, the journalist who broke barriers as a black woman in the Washington press corps, coined the term two decades ago, missing white women syndrome. It appears every time there is a sensationalized, media frenzied, missing woman, she's always white, blonde, blue eyes. Vanessa, Jonathan. This is, true. this is very true. Now the coverage of Miss Petito's disappearance in August, the discovery of her remains, and the search of her missing fiance is still ongoing. Uh, the disappearances of people of color tend not to generate the same volume of media interest. Uh, a report from the University of Wyoming found that 710 indigenous people were reported missing from 2011 to 2020 in that state, which is where Petito's remains were found. So 710 indigenous women missing in Wyoming. Uh, haven't heard anything about them. Haven't seen any news about it. We hear the news about Gabby Petito. Again, it's tragic, very tragic. Very. But again, also, we want to see everybody. Yeah. We want to see the same empathy. What what's yeah. missing? What what's missing? What's missing by at least certainly the news media, and perhaps even the American public, is empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy for missing women who are not white, blonde, blue eyes, because everybody's empathizing with the Petito family. What a horrible thing that's going we on. We all are. Okay, and we all are, whether you're black, white, yellow, green, blue, orange, doesn't matter. Absolutely. But really the, the missing white syndrome, what, what do they call it? White the women's White syndrome. women's syndrome. Mm -hmm. I, I think it comes down to empathy. People don't have the same amount of empathy if you're dark skinned and missing versus if you are white skinned, especially white, blue eyed, blonde. And that's very scary because, you know, you see how many cases there are where there were missing women of color. And, you know, you like you could if, if they actually had the help, they could have possibly got saved. You know what I mean? Right. Some some of them could have got saved, and you just don't know. And it's it's, it's really it's it's scary. It's, it's it's really scary. You know, I so. remember as a you go ahead, Vanessa. 
I had just, um, I, it, it, I think it all kind of depends on where you're getting your resources because to be honest, I found out about Gabby's story because I bumped into a page about the indigenous women and I started reading about the indigenous women that had gone missing and that led to, you know, them raising the awareness on that. And then is when I tapped into Gabby's story. Yeah. So it went backwards. Uh, you know, on Monday, Ada Navarro, she's a political commentator on CNN, a weekly guest host of ABC's The View. She had commented on Twitter that while she was glad the case of Petito was getting a lot of attention, I just want there to be some interest and energy. Ray, every disappeared young woman in America, brown, black, Native American, transgender. Uh, it's just... We're all human. Deserve the we, same there, treatment. There seems to be a lack of... I, I don't know why. I mean, you want to say it's racism. You want to say it's it's the, you know, it's not overt racism. It's that underlying, mm -hmm. you know, where you don't, you, you can't express it. You can't, but you feel an empathy for one group and not another. It's that underlying, unsaid, racist tendency right. that everybody has, including me. Right. You know, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm a perfect person. But um, but I think that's really what it comes down to. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm not a psychologist. I mean, you know, to me, like I said, I got my my major uh, or my master's in mass communication and media studies, and to me, it's just you know, it's it, a lot of it lies in the media's hand because we won't know about certain things unless the media does cover this, you know. So, you know, once we find out about it, we can throw it on our own personal social medias where we can raise the awareness. But if we don't know about the story in the first place, where we would get that information from the media. You know, we can't do it. So the media really has a big thing on um, what we know and like what they want us to know. Meanwhile, Mary Johnson, she's known as Mary Davis. She was last seen on November 20, 25th, 2020. And she is a member of the Tula Leap tribe. Uh, she was 39 years old. She was walking on a road in Western Washington en route to her home in a nearby town. And she never made it there. More than 10 months since Johnson was reported missing, a billboard on Interstate 5 and local media coverage have yielded few credible tips. Tribal police have yet to make an arrest in the case. The FBI has uh, announced a reward of $10,000 for any information regarding the disappearance of Mary Johnson, known as Mary Davis, but we don't see that on the news. At all. Okay, we don't see that in the media. And quite frankly, if it wasn't for Gabby Petito, and if it wasn't for people bringing up the fact that, hey, what about black, brown, uh, and dark-skinned women, we would never even be talking about Mary Johnson, right. Mary Davis, because we would never have heard of her. That's what I'm saying. After authorities announced on Sunday that they may have found the remains of Gabby Petito in Wyoming, a viral tweet reminded the public to keep 24-year-old Daniel Robinson in mind. A geologist who went missing in the desert just outside of Buckeye, Arizona, two months ago. A petition made by the Robinson family was, recreate, was created two weeks ago with the intention of holding accountable the Buckeye Police Department, the investigative agency on the case. 8,000 signatures were garnered by Monday. In it, his father, David Robinson, stated he has done more to find his son than, than the law enforcement agency since Daniel went missing. More than that, David Robinson wants the police to criminally investigate the son's disappearance due to findings from his own private investigator, including allegations that Daniel's Jeep was driven after crashing and the wow. crash site was staged. Wow. Robinson was last seen on the morning of June 23rd driving near Sun Valley Parkway and Cactus Road in his 2017 Blue Jeep Renegade. He did not tell anyone where he was going or why he was leaving and he has never been heard from. Police conducted searches by air and land, pulled phone records, checked hospitals for Robinson to no avail. Since then, the Buckeye Police Department has worked with outside agencies to search more than 70 square miles. A landowner found Robinson's significantly damaged Jeep on July 19th, four miles southwest of the site where Robinson was last seen. The vehicle was discovered in a ravine, crashed. Police confirmed on Monday that given the state of Robinson's vehicle, foul play is not suspected. 
which is why his case is not a criminal investigation. He stands at five foot eight. He has black hair, brown eyes, and there is a GoFundMe page uh, that has now raised over $40,000 for information as to the whereabouts of, uh, of Mr. Robinson. Not talking. a criminal case. Does that escalate, it being a criminal case or not, escalate to a missing person? Like a well, missing it's person certainly is a missing person. Right. And if the vehicle crashed and there's no body in the vehicle, that's extraordinarily strange. Where's, where's, where's the body? If you crashed a vehicle and killed yourself in a crash. Where's the body? Where's the body? Why is there no body there? Why is there no blood? Yeah. But how is foul play not, you know, suspected when they actually said like they felt like or it looked like the that scene was, you know, created. Well, that, well if that Gabby, if scene. Gabby Petito was a black woman, perhaps foul play would not have been suspected either. And nobody would have been searching for her. That's true. She just would have been another missing person. That's the point we're all trying to make here. One group seems to get a lot more attention than other groups. Our friends at the John Hopkins University, they claim 42 and a half million confirmed coronavirus cases, more than 681,000 deaths. Yesterday, the Food and Drug Administration authorized booster doses of the Pfizer vaccine for people 65 and older. They are still waiting. People who are also immunocompromised, who took the Pfizer, people who are in high risk jobs, such as healthcare workers, teachers, daycare staff, grocery workers, homeless shelters, prisons, and others should also take the booster. The, there's two million dollar questions right now. What the heck's a high risk job? Isn't everybody in a high risk job it's, at some point? You go to an office, you go to the subway, who's not in a high risk job? I mean, there are some that are. I don't know, I mean, if you're in an office setting, and you and you have lots uh, of people in your office. Are you not in a high risk job? Yeah, but you have you have, you have, you have, you have like bus drivers who are I think in a, a little bit. I, more I don't know. They risk. they don't they don't say who's high risk and who's not. That bothers me a little yeah, bit. They, they just should say, say that. Though. They just say yeah. if you're a high risk job. Like, okay. How are we supposed to know? Right. That I, I do. Understand. And 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 two, and two. What about Moderna? And what about uh, Johnson, Johnson and Johnson? Johnson? Right. What should people be doing with that? I'm a Moderna poppy. By the so. way, anecdotally, Moderna. <laughs> I, Moder should, I need to know. <laughs> Moderna supposedly has a Me longer too. has a longer lasting, longer lasting. According to the scientific studies that are coming out, Moderna is outperforming the Pfizer. Yes. Say as, it ain't yeah. so, because Pfizer have been talking that, a lot of crap yeah, but that's, us Moderna but that's, poppies but and that's mommies. But that's what it is at the moment. Wow. But of course, it always changes. <laughs> Last weekend, Frenchman Nathan Pauline, he walked a 600-meter slack line from the Eiffel Tower to the Chalet, Chalet Theater on the other side of the CN River. What? Yes, in a trip that took the 27-year-old about a half an hour. Do you know the difference between a slack line and a tightrope? Because this was not a tightrope. This was a slack line. Do you know the difference? No. A slack line has slack in it. Oh, hell no. So it's, so it's harder. It's, it's much like, harder. So it's it's almost curved down. Because tightrope is it's, tight. Tightrope is tight. A slack rope has a lot more give. You know, a tight rope is just you're walking on Give a me sidewalk. The tight rope. Yeah, you're walking on it. You're walking like you're walking on something tight. You know, that's not that's not bouncing up and down. Right. I don't think that made for that profession. I'm good either way. I don't want it. <laughs> I'm afraid of heights. So I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I, sometimes when I'm on a boat, I think I'm falling off the boat. Let alone, uh, <laughs> let alone, let alone on a slack or a tight rope. Yeah. Uh, I could trade. I. I could trade a hundred years that I would I would have I would have taken a dive right into the river. Yeah, that's wild. That's wild, isn't it? So um, he this is the second time he did it. He set the world record for the longest urban highline walk. Look at him, his, yeah, chilling. Yeah, and he just took a, he, he's still lying down on this thing. My boy is laid out like he is on a hammock. Yeah. What? Yeah, he holds several world records. His longest walk so far is sixteen hundred sixty-two meter highline. Suspended at a height of 300 meters at Cirque de Navacelles 
a landform in the massive central mountain region, south, southern France. I, I'm, I, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, there's got to be better ways to make a living, Vanessa, <laughs> than walking slack lines. Yeah, I um I choose other things in my life. <laughs> right. I, it, it ain't my journey. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. So uh two you want two million followers on Instagram? Oh depends on what I got let, to do. Let me tell you let me tell you how to get two million followers on Instagram. Follow what Sheila Rose Marchiori does in Brazil. She racked up two million followers on Instagram documenting her exploits as a Brazilian lorry driver, transporting fruits and vegetables across the country in a bright pink truck. The 30-year-old who goes by Sheila Belavar on social media says her lifelong dream has been to inspire other women to drive a truck. She told Wire Service News Flash that her custom hot pink uh, truck represents me, the milestone of a winning woman who came from nowhere from the countryside and today has her own things. Yes, it is marketing. Being a lady trucker influencer has helped Marchiori further profit off of her stereotype breaking image. And today she makes more money maintaining her YouTube channel and other platforms than she does actually trucking vegetables. <laughs> Vanessa. I don't would, even do you need a, do you, want a, do you want to get a bright pink truck? And start trucking vegetables around Florida. I mean, Nesquik could actually, I think you could, you <laughs> out of us three would be the, the closest one to be able to get yeah. this because I don't think I would look that yeah. good in a two piece tight. Brad, you know, you might. But next week, I think you'll look a lot better. I take on, I take on the challenge, boys. Yeah. No fear. All right. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll... All right. So we're going to get Vanessa a bright pink truck, and every day we'll ask her where she is. I mean, she's a social media like queen. So, like, you know, you're content creator queen. You should know. I think you could do this. I'll me figure it out. Me me <laughs> meanwhile, going to Japan, there's always some weird stuff going on in Japan. <laughs> A man was recently arrested for stealing a staggering 730 bras and panties from a laundromat. Tsuto Orado, 56, he was arrested last week after police found a huge stash of panties and bras in his apartment in the southern Japanese city of Beppu. Cops were first alerted to this troubling case when a 21-year-old college student spied Orada allegedly stealing six of her pairs of underwear. I can't. Officers discovered the rest of Arata's stolen haul when they tracked him down a week later. We have not confiscated such a large number of panties in years. You mean this is this is more than one person doing this? Oh my God, look at that. I always wondered what happened to my socks in the laundry. Maybe it was this guy. I always go with 10 pairs, you know, like 10 pairs of socks. Okay, and leave with and like... I leave, and I come back with eight. I'm always right. buying new socks. Leave alone, leave with eight. I leave yeah. with like mismatching pairs yeah and stuff. I, I i think i now know what happened to my missing socks you never know well, we have one one culprit i i <laughs> right. I, I, can tell, I do my laundry once every 10 days and i'm like what happened to all my socks <laughs> <laughs> my socks are always missing i mean Is somebody's after men's socks i mean you know there's fetishes for all <laughs> <laughs> Heading over to Buenos Aires, Argentina. We are really spanning the world right. today. We're really using yes. that plane today. <laughs> the world's largest rodents have returned. Ugh. And they are pooping in the wealthiest Ugh. part of Buenos Aires. Considered the world's oh largest rodents. They are capybaras. They are native, oh. they are native to Argentina. But the problem is right now... They have migrated to the wealthiest section of Buenos Aires. Is that Arthur? And they are pooping all over these people's lawns. <laughs> Y'all know the cartoon Arthur? Is that is that what he is? Because it looked yeah. like it. Now, now this all started when developers cleared 3,000 acres of critical wetlands on the banks of the Piranha River to create a oh, ultra-wealthy no. community of multi-million dollar homes. Uh, however... The uh, the capybaras were not too happy about losing their their cover in the wetlands, and now they never left their homes. They're just living 
in these wealthy people's community and poop it everywhere. It's a big problem for them. It's a you big problem what? for them. You said what? But they're like, they're like giant hamsters. Yeah, they're. I'm very just. Yeah, they're. It, it's like almost like it's almost like you would like fly to Jurassic Park and like see like some weird animal mm -mm. that you've never I've seen never before. I've never seen right? that before. Yeah. Now, despite the fact that the large rodents, which can be four feet long and weigh 175 pounds, it's like a yo-yo walking around, right? What? You're 175 pounds. No, I'm not. You're, you're 205. You're 205. <laughs> it's like a mini yo-yo walking Dang. around. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was 175. Uh, Enrique Viali, Argentine environmental lawyer, in a statement to the Guardian newspaper said, it's the other way around. Nord Delta invaded the ecosystem of the Carpinchos. So basically people are saying that these capi capybaras are invading their multi-million dollar homes, but really it's, they cleared the land and they made these homes. So it's it was there. basically the people, the rich people right, who home. invaded the capybaras homes. But it's a big problem there in Argentina. Big problem there. All right, we don't have those problems in Miami and New York, though, right? No. Uh, um, actually, in New York, we definitely do, because I've seen rats that big as I've, well. I've never seen rats that are 175 pounds. <laughs> All seen, rats look like that to me. <laughs> I've seen some big ones, but not that All big. All rats look like that to me. <laughs> <laughs> yo yo scared of birds and rats apparently down if you saw a 175 pound rat what would you do yo yo the would same thing i do when i see a rat you, right in you, front of you me run, run you run <laughs> run you might get a little belch out of me a little yell thanks for watching for more bradshaw live like and subscribe to our youtube channel